I have been pounding the table for some time for the fundamentals of the two-year spot on the bond curves. And here's another prominent voice agreeing with that premise. That was Stan Druckenmiller, the hedge fund manager at a conference just last week. And we can understand exactly where he's coming from because we've been talking about the two-year, massive leverage position in the two-year, getting nervous in recent weeks. Those are all the themes that we've been following here at Eurodollar University. And so today's video, we're going to go into why someone like Druckenmiller would be increasingly concerned in recent weeks and therefore what makes the two-year spot on the curve so attractive. Now, the two-year fundamentals, I talked about this in a recent video, so we'll just review them uh, briefly here. Remember what happened uh, back in March and April with the banking crisis, or the first stage of the banking crisis. The two-year rate just dropped off a cliff with Silicon Valley Bank. Massive amounts of hedging, fear trade, and all of that. And it kept up through March, April, into the very early part of May. But then... The two-year took picked up on this disinflation trend that we're going to go over in just a minute, and yields rose at the middle part of the curve, that spot on the curve, but only until early July. That was the key. Early July, and really since early July, the two-year treasury, like the two-year German shots, they've been relatively stable all throughout, right up until today. Right now, the two-year is at back at 5.02%. That seems to be where the two-year treasury wants to go, right around 5%, while we wait for confirmation of this disinflation pattern that we see throughout the economy. So while bond yields have been screaming higher in the long end of each curve, this crucial, critical spot right up at the front has been basically sitting out the entire sell-off this entire time, which raised a bunch of questions that we're now getting more clear answers to. What we were suspecting does appear to be the case. And now hedge fund managers like Druckenmiller, we've talked about Bill Ackman and Bill Gross, they get increasingly nervous about what's happening across the global economy. Risks are rising precipitously. Now, Druckenmiller, should be pointed out, said that he's still bearish on the long end because of especially treasury supply, which is a major factor to consider. But when you also consider the September effect combined with the fundamentals price in the two-year, it might make sense that long-end yields might go lower from here. That's where Germany already is, as I talked about in a video just a couple days ago. So regardless of your position on the long end, the short end looks to be fundamental. So we've got more data from all over the world this week, including today, some stark statistics in the United States even, suggesting that this disinflation rebound has run its course. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that disinflation has run its course. That continues to be where we're heading. That continues to be what we see in the statistics, whether they be consumer prices or producer prices or forward-looking indications. The disinflation is continuing. What I'm talking about is the disinflation rebound or the economic rebound that was created when price pressures began to materially reduce at the last part of last year into the early part of this year. And this is a pattern we see all over the place. We had the major downturn in 2022, everybody talking about recession. It actually happened in some places. But then as price pressures really receded, especially in Europe, it led, led to this economic rebound. So as disinflation deepened, didn't become transitory, it continued and got, got even stronger through the middle part of this year, the economy all around the world experienced varying degrees of a rebound through the middle part of this year. But it wasn't the soft landing. It wasn't a recovery. It wasn't a no landing. It was a temporary effect in response to that initial stage of disinflation. So while disinflation is going to continue in the future, the economic benefit from disinflation was temporary. And now what Druckenmiller sees, the same thing that we've seen, the same thing that's been priced in the two-year spot on the curves, is that the disinflation trend in the economy is beginning to wear off and maybe really quickly. That's the concerning part when you get to especially the U.S. data and especially on services. But where you can see this disinflation trend maybe the easiest is where it started first, where it happened first, and that's in Europe. 
And just yesterday, the Europeans reported on gross domestic product. The Germans reported on retail sales. And when you look through these statistics, what you see is perfect example of the disinflationary trend in the economy that I'm talking about. This, this pattern, again, not disinflation itself, but the response in the economy. You look at European GDP, it's exactly what I just described before. You had a very small negative in the fourth quarter of last year, very small negative, but that was enough to kickstart what was really a recession. And just to be clear here, nobody has declared an official recession in Europe, but if you look at all the statistics, what you see is exactly what looks like a recession. We don't need no we don't need some government or some private group of economists to tell us that Europe has been in recession since last year. The markets already did that, beginning with the curve inversions that showed up and really deepened right around the time all of this was unfolding. So the European statistics, the updated numbers for GDP, you got the negative in the fourth quarter of last year, which started a shallow recession. You got the tiny rebound in the first quarter, which is this disinflation rebound that I'm talking about. So we're still in recession, or Europe is still in recession, and it gets a little bit of a positive quarter in the first quarter, and it got a little bit more positive in the second quarter. But again, Europe being ahead of us on this, on this pattern, on this, this trend, the European economy already started to roll over and fall off again in the third quarter. So where the U.S. just experienced a monstrous positive GDP number for the third quarter, Europe was already back into its recession. And it never really left the recession, but it was already back into its recession in the third quarter, which we see now in the preliminary data for European GDP, which was a very small negative. We find the same trend, as I mentioned, in German retail sales, and likely we're going to see it again in continental-wide European retail sales, too. And because we see it in retail sales in Germany across Europe, that's one reason why we suspect, along with some other forward indicators, that this small negative in the third quarter in Europe is only the start of the real recession, which is just now emerging, which is why curves have been inverted. Talked about your Riber curve in that video just from a couple of days ago, why they've become even more inverted recently, the most they've been inverted since June and May. So with German retail sales and European retail sales struggling mightily to this degree and conforming to the same general pattern, that indicates that the trouble remains ahead of us as it's been all of this time. You look at German retail sales, same thing, same exact thing, eerily similar. Down big toward the end of 2022, but then they started to rebound both in nominal terms and really kind of flattened out in real terms. Nominal spending rebounded in 2023 up until around May. And ever since May, starting in June through the summertime, we see nominal spending down in three of the four months through September, September being the latest figure, and September being the second month in a row where nominal retail sales in Germany are lower. In real retail trade in uh, Germany, down at the end of 2022, kind of bottomed out in rebounded a tiny little bit in the middle part of 2023, but only until May. Again, the disinflation pattern in the economy, not disinflation, already seems to have run its course in Europe. And throughout the entire summertime, it's rolling over into more and more serious recession that Europe never really got out of to begin with. We see that in this, these hard statistics. We've seen it coming in the soft numbers, the so-called soft numbers like S&P Global's PMI, which suggests a lot worse is yet to come. And it's also a warning for the rest of the global economy, in particular the United States, because Europe went first. They were in the downturn recession to begin with. They came into the disinflationary rebound before anyone else, and they came out of it before everyone else. And they're looking at worse economic conditions moving ahead. Again, you can see what Druckenmiller was talking about when he said he's concerned in recent weeks. Turning our attention now to the United States, the United States, which supposedly has this massively strong labor market, just put up 5% or almost 5% in third quarter GDP, yet we still see the same trends in all the economic statistics, including GDP to a lesser extent. What we find is that downturn end of last year, the upturn was a little bit later into the middle of the year, and now not just the economy rolling over late summer into autumn, but rolling over potentially sharply. 
I've mentioned this before, Federal Reserve Regional Services Survey. So forward-looking sentiment numbers on the services economy and one after another after another. We've got three of them now and they're almost identical in showing this same exact trend. We've got the services survey from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. That one bottomed out around January. It kind of stuck around the bottom through the middle for the early part of the year. It really didn't pick up again until June and July in the summertime. So while Europe was already rolling over, the US was just then picking up on its disinflation rebound, but it only lasted in the New York survey until September and October. September, we got another downturn. In October, you can see really plummeted lower. Big drop in October. That's exactly the same as what Dallas just reported this week. The Dallas Fed or the Texas Services Outlook Survey, I think it's called. Same thing. You got, the, you got a big time drop last year. It bottomed out around December and it kept along the bottom until May. But then you get a modest rebound, this disinflation rebound through the middle part of the year that topped out around August. And then September, it starts to roll over, a little bit of a drop in September, and then another real big, a plummet in October. Again, what Drucken Miller was talking about. That's two services survey. Third one, Richmond Fed services survey, Mid-Atlantic States. That one bottomed out a little bit later in April and then rebounded August and September. So it was a little bit further behind, a month further behind than the other services survey, but another substantial decline in October. So three in a row showing the disinflation pattern and more strongly showing that the disinflation rebound in the economy, even though disinflation is going to continue, the disinflation in the rebound in the economy has completely run its course, left, left the U.S. economy exposed to the downside, the continued downside that is now emerging yet again across all of these statistics and across all of the global system. We see it to an extent, too, in the manufacturing surveys, the Federal Reserve's manufacturing survey and the latest for the ISM, which just came out today with some shockingly low numbers there. The regional manufacturing surveys, I've just averaged the five of them together. There's five of them. There's New York, Philadelphia, Richmond, Kansas City, and Dallas. You take those five and average them together. And what do you see? The disinflation pattern yet again. The average of the five manufacturing surveys, those bottomed out with the inventory cycle around May, but then you get a moderate rebound. I won't really call it a rebound. It's not really improvement. It became less negative. So less of a negative impact from the inventory cycle up until August. And it never really got all that far, but then it starts to go lower in September. And now we're getting more concerning numbers in manufacturing again for October. It's not yet to the same degree as the early part of this year, but as you can see clearly, that's where manufacturing and the manufacturing surveys are heading. So the disinflation rebound in regional Fed manufacturing surveys, that's over with, even though the disinflation pictured in those surveys, as I talked about recently, especially in you know, the Kansas City Feds, those price numbers are continuing to decline. Disinflation is continuing, but the disinflation effect on the economy it's done with. That was finished in the summertime and more and more. Again, we see this rolling over. And that brings us to the latest statistics from the United States. That's the ISM's manufacturing, the granddaddy of all the PMIs, which unexpectedly declined and declined sharply once again in the month of October. That one, again, just like all of these other surveys, bottomed out around March Stayed in a low, stayed in that low level until around June. We got a moderate pickup again during the summertime that uh, reached its highest point August, September, but really only got to 49 in the ISM. So it wasn't really a rebound. Again, just like the Fed manufacturing surveys, just less negative. But now from 49 down to 46.7 in October, another big drop in October and 46.7 is only a little bit above that earlier year, earlier in the year low that marks the beginning of the disinflation rebound trend. So we're already right back in terms of the ISM to where it had been at the low point earlier in this year. You can see why Druckenmiller is concerned. As 
as we see in the internals of the ISM-2. New orders fell all the way back to 45.5. The employment index dropped down to 46.8. And this comment from the ISM that was in the press release, I think sums up what the real dangers are in all of this, the entire global disinflationary trend, the fundamentals of the two-year spot on the curve. Panelist companies had stable month-over-month -month production. That's not the part. It's just this, this little comment they just kind of sneak in here and took more immediate actions to reduce headcounts using layoffs as the primary tool. That's really the big concern, and that's where the fundamentals of the two are, and that's what Druckenmiller and all the rest of them are concerned about in the fundamentals of the two-year. That as the disinflationary effect on the economy wears off, and we really do start to roll over and maybe roll over quickly, that labor hoarding, which has marked much of this year, uh, companies decide they don't want to hoard workers anymore. Because remember what they've been saying all along. We expect this downturn to be shallow, and eventually it'll just dissipate. It'll go away, and we can get back to business. So we don't want to fire our workers because we're anticipating a recovery relatively quickly. And for a time in the middle part of the year in the United States, earlier part of the year in Europe, that seemed to be how it was working out. Businesses thought we've got this rebound, maybe that's the start of an actual recovery and the boom will be on the other side in 2024. So they, hold, they, they held on to their workers, they hoarded their workers, they didn't get engaged in mass layoffs, they weathered the downturn by cutting hours and hiring fewer workers and all of the cost-cutting measures that go along with those, but they didn't get into the layoffs. However, if the disinflationary effect has indeed worn off, regardless of disinflation continuing moving forward, and the economy does move lower into a more significant downturn, like in the latter part of last year and later part of this year, how are companies going to respond to a renewed downturn and recession contraction? And one that is being experienced all over the world, including China, as I mentioned just yesterday. Well, it's more likely, in fact, it's probably very likely that they're finally going to say, we've had enough. We can't continue to hold on to these workers. Even though we would like to, we're going to have to start the layoffs. And that's the comment the ISM made, suggesting that as this renewed downturn really does begin to develop, and it won't just be manufacturers that lay off workers. That's, that's the important part of bringing up the services surveys, because if this does happen and businesses do de-hoard their workers, it's going to be in widespread fashion of the kind and degree that we all associate with recession anyway. The recession was always coming. It was just delayed by this temporary, dare I say transitory, disinflationary effect on the global economy. But increasingly we see in widespread fashion, consistent fashion, that's done. And it leaves us with looking at the fundamentals of the two-year spot on the curve, which all along said, look out below. The video I did just recently on the fundamentals of the two-year spot on the curve, that's the one linked below me. I thank you very much for joining me. Huge thank you, Eurodollar University members, Eurodollar University subscribers. And until next time, take care.